This video is brought to you by Verve. Check out verve.co forward slash gaijin or link in the description to get a 30 day free trial of a dozen channels worth of shows, movies, and anime, both new and nostalgic. Hey everyone, Kaijin Kumba here, and welcome back to Culture Shock! We break down your favorite games and anime and discover the culture that inspired them, and... What are you doing? I got a horrible writer's block. It's Black History Month, and I thought it'd be kind of cool to showcase an anime or game that took a lot of inspiration from African and or African American culture, and immediately I was like, Afro Samurai, duh. In fact, as I recall, back when the movie first came out in Japan, you actually helped advertise it in Akihabara. Guilty as charged. Man, that was back in 2009. Freaking Afro Samurai's been around for almost a decade? Uh, maybe we need a recap. Uh, spoilers, by the way. Yeah, this is a 10-year-old movie, so I think it's fair game. All right. In pre-Edo Japan, where knowledge of the sword makes right and matchlock technology was first making its mark on the country, and where flip phones and SD cards were in regular use, apparently, alongside flamethrowers, grenade launchers, machine guns, lasers, terminators, and... Hey, that a motherfucking RPG? You got a motherfucking RPG? Yeah, but to be fair, Takashi Okazaki, creator of Afro Samurai himself, said that he was heavily influenced by hip-hop, soul music, soul train of all things, and other aspects of Western culture. But at the same time, so much of Takashi's world is built around the history of his home. Architecture and a lot of Eastern religious iconography create some of the most breathtaking scenes in this show. Yeah, but you can't forget Phil Lamar, John DiMaggio, Greg Eagles, and Terrence C. Carson chewing the scenery like it's Sunday morning. Wash over us the supreme power. Let us pay homage to the Holy Way. Cause if you're a sinner, he's gonna plug his infernal modem in the wall, belching smoke and flame. There's a lot of isms in this anime, but rather than insulting or belittling the inspiration as is the usual takeaway from anime that do this kind of thing, Afro Samurai uses it as a foundation for the world that the story takes place in. Air Jordan Geta, the ongoing theme of lemonade, the other southern traditional drink right next to sweet tea, and that freaking bling straw. I love it. And we certainly cannot forget the performance of mother and Samuel L. Jackson as both Afro Samurai and Ninja Ninja. Playing out the mix of solemn, stoic determination, dealing with the brutal world that isn't giving you any handouts, and the no-nonsense fast talker who calls it like he sees it. But there are still a lot of Japanese-isms that make the world still feel like Japan. Like? Like the entire freaking premise of the story. The whole of Afro Samurai revolves around the numbered headbands. Whoever has the number one headband is classified the greatest warrior in the world and essentially is given the power and authority of a god. No one but the number two headband carrier can challenge him. However, anyone can challenge the number two. By the end of it all, it's revealed that it's not about who has the number one headband, but who has all the headbands. This, I believe, is a callback to a field day game in Japan known as Kibasen. Yeah, no joke. This hard as nail movie plot revolves around what kids do for PE. Though more specifically played during their taikusai or sports festival, kids form groups of four with one being the rider with a bandana on their head and the other three making up the chariot. The objective of the game is for the rider to grab the headbands off of other riders. Now while the chariot members can't use their arms, they can use their momentum to knock down other teams so that the riders can grab their headbands. But if you lose your headband or a member of your chariot is dismembered from the team, you're out. And the last one with their headband on their head wins. So it's a quite literal interpretation then. Everyone's going around trying to get Afro's headband and put him out in the most real way possible. And when it comes to losing your headband, like it was in the case of Justice, the main antagonist of the series, it was an actual dismembering that won Afro the game, so to speak. Exactly, but I don't feel like that's really good enough for a video. It's a mishmash of really cool shoutouts to African American and Japanese cultures, but it needs to mean something, you know? Something central and awesome. Something that would be really worth putting out there for Black History Month. Well then, why not talk about the real Afro Samurai? Who? Yasuke, retainer to Oda Nobunaga. Though I like to refer to him as the Obsidian Samurai, cause dang if he wouldn't have earned that title. So, what's this guy about? Well, little is actually known about Yasuke before his arrival to Japan. Most people theorize that he was a slave from Mozambique, but others say he could have come from Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, Southern Sudan, or even Portuguese born into slavery. But regardless of where Yasuke was actually from, according to the 1581 report of Jesuit Luis Fro to the church, corroborated by the Nobunaga chronicle Shin Shokoki, Yasuke found his way to Japan as a slave attendant to the missionary Alessandro Valignano. 
who was checking into a missionary group that had been stationed within the country. See, unlike the tight-fisted, domineering Toyotomi Hideyoshi who would succeed him, Oda Nobunaga was actually pretty chill with Christianity in Japan. In fact, he even helped missionaries build a church in Kyoto. But while Alessandro was keeping an eye on the church, it felt like the entirety of Japan was keeping an eye on Yasuke. I mean, I get that folk of African descent can draw a lot of attention in Japan, but good lord, this was on another level. People came from far and wide to check out this dark-skinned man from across the sea, and as far as historic documentation can tell, Yasuke was a pretty good-looking dude. Tokuga Iyasu's retainer, Matsudaira Ietada, described Yasuke as having a height of 6 shaku and 2 sun, basically 6 foot 2. And Oda Nobunaga himself stated that Yasuke had the strength of 10 men. So yeah, ripped as all get out, several feet taller than the average person in the country, and dark as ebony? Yeah, he drew a lot of attention. So much so that it said that people actually trampled over each other with casualties just to see Yasuke. And of course, eventually getting the attention of the great unifier of Japan himself, Oda Nobunaga. The relationship between Yasuke and Oda was actually really cool. Though not completely fluent, Yasuke had a basic understanding of the Japanese language, and he and Oda hit it off pretty well. Though I'm sure it was more than a little weird when Oda ordered him to take off his shirt and scrub his body to prove that he wasn't covered in ink. But after that, it was almost like a bromance. Oda Nobunaga gave this humble slave his new name of Yasuke, gave him a house, a ton of money, and even an ornate katana. So despite being a mass murderer of Buddhist monks, women, children, and calling himself the Demon King of the Sixth Heaven, essentially the devil, at least Oda Nobunaga wasn't a racist. No, no he was not. Because after Yasuke made his rounds within Japan alongside Foy for the first couple of months, upon the return of the capital, Oda Nobunaga personally took Yasuke out of slavery to the Portuguese and made him an arms bearer. Now this might seem like a low rank position or even another version of slavery, but remember, Oda Nobunaga's successor and second of the great shogun of Japan, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, started off as a sandal bearer for Nobunaga. Though sadly so little is mentioned of him, from what history did record about Yasuke, he was a loyal and respected member of Nobunaga's retainers, serving and fighting for Oda while making a name for himself as a samurai. Where Ieyasu Tokugawa had English sailor William Adams at his side as a foreign retainer, Nobunaga had Yasuke who had gone from a slave at the heels of his Portuguese masters to one of the most elite within Nobunaga's court, and would fight alongside him in the many battles that led up to Oda's defeat. One such historical fight was the Battle of Tenmokuzan, the last stand of the Takeda clan's mighty cavalry force before the combined efforts of Nobunaga and Iyasu crushed the clan into nothingness. It was actually the first time when Iyasu Tokugawa actually met Yasuke, commenting on his extraordinary height. But alas, this bromance met its end when Nobunaga was double-crossed by one of his journals, Akechi Mitsuhide at Honoji Temple in 1582. But you better believe Yasuke was right there with Nobunaga, fighting off Mitsuhide's forces trying to protect his lord. But in the end, Nobunaga was forced into seppuku and Yasuke was captured. Curiously though, Mitsuhide didn't kill him like he did with Nobunaga's other retainers. Whether it was because Akechi saw him as an animal, or since that Yasuke wasn't Japanese, it would be wrong to hold him to the same unspoken rules, Yasuke was sent back to the Portuguese as Mitsuhide took over, back to the life of slavery and obscurity from history. God, that freaking sucks! It does, but I think it's an amazing story of how one African slave transcended the garbage life he was thrusted into, and made his mark on one of the most important periods of Japanese history, proving himself to and befriending the most important man of that period. And believe it or not, he may not have actually been the first obsidian samurai the country's ever seen. Saka no Ye no Tarumamado, a paragon of a warrior during the Heian period and personal guard of Emperor Kamu in the late 700s, is theoretically believed to have had African descent. So in honor of Black History Month, I think it's important to remember that the impact that African descended people made in history transcends far beyond the US or even Europe for that matter. One man, born into slavery, became an elite within the court of one of Japan's most influential people in history. And I'm sure there are even more unheard stories similar to this waiting to be told. But thanks for watching everyone. And hey, speaking of dynamite performances from African American actors, if you haven't seen it yet, you gotta check out Jinlock over on Verve. The creators of Ruby have crafted together a brand new action series featuring some of the coolest elements of sci-fi. Mechs, nanomachines, mechs, neural interfacing, mechs, high-powered VTOLs, did I mention mechs? But the icing on the cake is our lead protag is voiced by freaking Michael B. Jordan. But hey, if high-octane sci-fi isn't your thing, there's a dozen channels worth of movies, animes, and TV shows both new and nostalgic at your fingertips on Verve. 
So if you'd like to check out other channels like Boomerang, Nick Splat, Rooster Teeth, Crunchy Roll, Cartoon Hangover, and many, many more, you can try them all ad-free by heading over to verve.co forward slash gaijin, or use the link in the description to get a 30-day free trial of Verve's premium service. Not only can you watch Undisturbed, you can even download videos to watch later offline through your smart devices. So if that sounds like a sweet deal, just pop on over to verve.co forward slash gaijin and get your free trial today. Otherwise, if you're dying for even more culture and gaming and anime, be sure to check out the rest of Culture Shock and Witch Ninja to learn even more about the world we live in through your favorite shows and games. But until next time, everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.